Um, hi, yeah. My name's uh, Will Partridge. I'm the research officer of the Wiltshire Museum, and I've recently started a, <clears throat> and I've recently started a, a, a master's research degree with the University of Exeter. And uh, this presentation is uh, on the sort of the result of uh, is go, going over um, is going over a research project that I did while well, Spines Liaison Officer for Wiltshire, um, sort of over the course of last uh, last year. So, um, Roman and British pewter tablewares are, sim are simultaneously fairly enigmatic and also mundane. They're often poorly preserved and recovered from contexts with little in the way of strat stratigraphic associations. And given that they are metal plates and bowls, I think there's also an assumption that we know what they're for and how they were used. And this is perhaps why they receive relatively little academic attention. They tend to be mentioned in passing, typically as evidence for a broader interpretation. So for Esmond Cleary, writing in 1989, hordes of pewter were evidence for the wealth of the villa elite, and therefore indirectly evidence for the unrest at the closing in the closing decades of Roman Britain. Um, I'm sorry, just, just going to check that chat's not people not being able to hear me. No, that's fine. Sorry about this. Um, there we go. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, for um, Cool, who discusses um, culinary practices, notes that there's notes really that uh, metal vessels tend to be deposited in magical ritual deposits, and they essentially uh, move on from there. Since 1950, there's probably only really been a handful of papers which have critically engaged with Romana British Pewter. And whilst they have made important contributions to our understandings of the production, the social and geographic distributions, and depositional uh, contexts, um, a critical reading of the most recent study by Leed in 2009 reveals that many of the assumptions which underpinned uh, Wedlick's uh, study in 1958 and even earlier studies uh, remain to be challenged. I believe that the increased corpus of, um, of Pewter in Wiltshire that, that, um, that we uh, that I've managed to um, find, uh, originally from a search for parallels for a metal detectorous find, demonstrates that it's now time we, we start to move beyond these assumptions. So this study has been able to uh, substantially increase the number of known pewter vessels and, associ and associated sites in Wiltshire to about 90 vessels across just over 20 sites. It's uh, fair to say that Wiltshire is no longer the negative space that it previously appeared as, and whilst some additional sites are recent discoveries, a surprising number are actually poorly published historic finds in the collections of, muse of local museums. So in general, the Wiltshire corpus doesn't really contradict any of the main observations of Lee, uh, observations Lee and others built up over the years. Whilst earlier vessels are known from major towns like London and Bath, the production of pewter in Britain expanded hugely around the mid third century. And in line with this, all of Wiltshire's late pewters, all of Wiltshire's pewter is late Roman. The majority of Wiltshire's very rare single finds are found in association with villas, although this may reflect the fact that most are really from 20th, are from early, early 20th century excavations. But pewter also increasingly permeated the settlement hierarchy, and this is um, particularly apparent if you take hoard, uh, hoard evidence in mind, um, into account. Uh, pewter vessels were cast in a limestone mould, and there are a particular um, concentration of these known in the Mendip Hills of Somerset. Whilst the, the vessel moulds in Wiltshire are limited to the region of the county that borders the Mendips, the end evidence from ingots and scraps suggests that, similar to other industries, small-scale pewter working was, uh, was adopted at a variety of settlement types. And by the end of the uh, period, made uh, formed part of a quite a mix, increasingly mixed economy. Interestingly, uh, ingot found by a melt detectorist in Barrachalk in the south of the county has a composition that's typical for late Roman future plates, reminding us that a large number of vessels on rural sites, especially, were almost certainly recycled. In this talk, I'm going to focus on, in particular on the hoard evidence and how we can interpret them. <clears throat> 
Lee devotes an entire chapter to identifying horticulture from um, explicitly ritual contexts. I want to draw particular attention to a couple of his, a couple of his conclusions. So Lee argues that in the absence of indisputably ritual contents or contexts, hordes deposited on dry land are best understood as, sec as secular hoarded wealth of the villa elite, and that pewter had become a signifier of elite identity, something which the rural population at large could not access or had no desire to. Although framed in the language of identity, this interpretation is functionally identical to earlier ones, and represents a failure to challenge interpretations which are now as much as a century old. These can be framed as such. Hordes of pewter represent secular hordes of wealth, and because of these are and because of this are store because these are stores of wealth, that means that pewter must have been in itself highly a high valued high valued tableware. And that surely only the villa elite could have therefore have afforded such collections as these hordes. Each of these assumptions then effectively feeds back in on the other two supporting them. I first want to explore the left two assumptions, although I'm by no means the first to criticise them, and I'll be discussing the arguments raised in Porton and Scott's 1993 paper further below. Lee's, Lee is by, first, uh, by no means the first to suggest a link between the inhabitants of villas and pewter hordes. It has long been recognised that they are limited to lowland Britain and as more examples are found, they particularly seem to be linked to the villa rich central zone or belt, which covers the area sort of spreading from about Exeter leading up to uh, the Cambridgeshire Fens and it, uh, uh, further up along the northeast coast. What is particularly interesting, eh, though, is that even at a county level resolution, this observation holds true in Wiltshire. Almost all of the hordes known have been found in North Wiltshire and in particular around Verluccio and Canescio, which is a region part of the central belt. There is then a smaller secondary concentration following the course of the River Avon. Both of these are the main areas of villa occupation and counting. This makes interpretation fairly simple until you start to look more closely at these groups in detail. I'm going to discuss in order uh, the hordes found at Lynham, Fygeldean, Blagenhill, and Manton. The Horde at Lynham was excavated by Wessex Archaeology in 2015. The excavations identified Romano British rural settlements spanning the late 1st to 4th centuries AD, a settlement which appears to have been a relatively typical agrarian settlement for the region. Within the same area of a set of broadly dated late Roman graves were a pair of adjacent pits, which is sort of um, outlined in red on the image. One of these pits contained an extremely poorly preserved hoard of at least five pewter plates and dishes, as well as six late Roman coins that provide a terms post quem of the late uh, fourth or early fifth centuries. The other pit contained, a further, contained further coins and a potentially unique calyx shaped copper alloy object. Whilst the dis disarticul disarticulated remains of a neonate burial appear to be redeposited from the fill of one pit into the other. Andrews, the excavator, argues that in particular in considering the symbolic connotations of the calyx in uh, Romano British iconography, the ritual, di ritual deposition appears to be the most convincing in both cases. The second group is uh, from uh, Fargodine, which were ploughed up between the mid 80s and mid, and mid 1990s, although most of the 11 vessels were found in the same location over 1993 and 1994. Fortunately, the farmer kept relatively detailed records of individual find spots, and he then donated the vessels and other artefacts to the Salisbury Museum, where they were recorded by Nick Griffiths. The pewter is one part of a large assemblage of Romano British coins and artefacts, which relate to a known to a known Iron Age and Romano British assessment, one which has been one which has uh, seen extensive geophysical survey, and even a pair of pipeline trenches by by a Wessex archaeology, which unfortunately seemed to have missed the hoard by mere metres. Because of this, we know that the hoard relates to another uh, agrarian settlement, one which seems to have gained a corridor with it later in its life. Obviously, we lack any direct stratigraphic associations, but the hoard almost certainly relates to a large cemetery which seems to characterise the final, the final phase of occupation of the east edge of the settlement. With at least two graves in its immediate vicinity, 
The cemetery also contained deposits typical of what would probably uh, would probably previously be called Romano-Celtic ritual activity, such as a dog skeleton deposited in the fill of one grave and half of a sandal uh, deposited behind the head of another. Another area of the site has produced an ingot and there are a large scatter of lead weights uh, suggesting pewter or, lead pewter or lead working on the site. Um, the hoard of approximately seven vessels at Blagan Hill was excavated by the Wiltshire Archaeological uh, Field Group between 1992 and 1994. Although the group had, all, although the group had already uh, been extensively disturbed by agricultural activity on the site. The finds from Blagan Hill were, were all scattered, scattered throughout the topsoil, so we have no detailed context. But the structural, but structural remains suggest a Romano British building in the vicinity. This is actually one of two pewter hordes in the immediate landscape, as we have a reference to a historic find of pewter vessels in Leigh Woods in the 19th century, as well as to an 18th century discovery of an undated coin hoard in a copper alloy jug on neighbouring Roundway Hill. The hoard of pewter was actually completely overshadowed by an exceptional hoard of coins, jewellery and copper alloy vessels also discovered on the same site, 20 metres away from the hoard of pewter with this collection dating to the early 5th century. There may even be a hoard of ironwork on site that went unrecognised, as is suggested by a Roman ads and cleat in the register of accession material. Finally, we have the Manton Hoard, easily the most famous in Wiltshire. The hoard was discovered in the late 19th century by workmen, who also discovered a small hoard of Romano-British coins dating up to Honorius in the early 5th century, as well as some human remains. More recently, metal detectors have also discovered a cut and folded lead tank and a hoard of ironwork on the same, uh, in the same area. Very few of the vessels from the Manton Hoard survive, but it's notable that one of these does, is faintly inscribed with the name Justine, and whether this is the name of the owner of the hoard or potentially the depositor of this specific plate, as has been argued by Paulton and Scott, is open to debate. Certainly, those that uh, those who used the vessels did not seem to have mind did not seem to have minded that the craftsperson who decorated another vessel within the group uh, didn't uh, had tried out their punch beforehand. None of these dry land hoards seem to have been deposited in a location secure enough to store private wealth. Three appear to to represent a location which was returned to on more than one occasion for the purpose of structured deposition and two are deposited with an area of relatively dense archaeological activity, specifically cemeteries. Although obviously we do get uh, crisis deposits of things like uh, coins during phases of unrest like the English Civil War, some of these plates are about half a meter in uh, diameter. So these are quite considerably sized hoards, especially when you think the hoard as a collective group. If you're, um, it's going to be quite unlikely you're going to be, you know, to dig these holes unnoticed. In both, the, the fact that these are seem to be known locations, in both cases implies a communal aspect to the actions, at least to me. The crisis hoarding explanation is bound up in traditional ideas of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where Roman villa owners had a, mo a modern rationalist mindset and Roman Britain would seem to have come to a Roman end, uh, a violent end. Yet whilst few would seriously argue that the late fourth and early fifth centuries were not a period of profound change, the evidence for widespread unrest and, or violence simply does not exist, especially in rural contexts. And the historical references which underpinned the narrative of conflict are now understood to probably be exaggerations, often for the current and for the emperor's benefit. The distinction between ritual and secular contexts has now long been recognized as arbitrary in prehistoric archaeology, and the debate, the, date, the debate surrounding the interpretation of pewter has, has strong similarities to that around so-called founders' hordes of the late Bronze Age, and similar criticisms can be raised. Why is such an apparently ineffective means of storing wealth so widespread? But perhaps more importantly, it's unclear as to why dry land uh, depositions are viewed within a completely different interpretive framework to those deposited around water. The question now becomes, 
How representative are these sites? It's hard to say, but no hoard in Wiltshire has been confirmed as coming from a sterile context. And those from rural settlements or small towns are close to forming a majority. And even those sites where we know essentially nothing about the definitional context, there's usually a hint that there is some other form of a Roman activity on the site. So it seems that rather than a simple one-to-one -one relationship between villa inhabitants, it may be that there are these villa dense regions were in fact uh, more integrated within a what were uh, were more integrated within the wider market economy, and this this impacted access to the vessels and potentially social practices. So Paulson and Scott have of course previously made the argument the majority of hordes are ritual in nature, as well as as well as asking to what extent we can even be certain that most pewter ever saw domestic use. They argue that pewter is often poorly made and little used, suggestions that are hard to test quantitatively due to the frequently poorly preserved, uh, poorly, poorly preserved nature of these vessels. This does raise a wider question, however. What did pewter do in late Roman society? To borrow the terminology of Pitts and Van Oyen, previous interpretations of pewter have been uh, in representative terms treating pewter as proxy evidence for elite identity, social unrest, or in the case of Paulton and Scott, late Roman religious practices. Such discussions have a habit of getting stuck in circular arguments and are not very informative about how an artifact functioned in a social, in a social context. A way forward to answering this question is suggested by the final horde of vessels I'm going to discuss from Wiltshire, the vessels found at Spray's farm. Unfortunately, the original context for the, for the discovery of these vessels has been lost uh, to time. They were discovered at some point in the uh, 1980s, probably during farming landscaping, but the actual exact details aren't recorded in museum records. This hoard was found adjacent to a river and is thus uh, uh, what you would more traditionally interpret as a, a ritual hoard. And uh, was found, and this river was actually overlooked by a uh, Romano British settlement, again with very, uh, evidence for late, very late occupation, and with an interesting array of Romano British brooches and uh, potential coin hoards, which has led to the suggestion that it probably had a ritual component on the site. Despite only containing a modest four pewter vessels, the hoard also contained a number of ceramic vessels, including a decorated beaker. Uh, Oxfordshire colour coated ware, um, Oxfordshire colour coated ware platter, and a collection of relatively bog standard Alice Holt Farnham ware uh, vessels, uh, a jar and a bowl. The hoard represents a modest example of the sort of mixed hoards that are more uh, are known for more famous examples, such as the Dra uh, Draper's Garden hoard of copper alloy, iron, and pewter vessels, and demonstrates that pewter was just one element of a wider milieu of late Roman tablewares. And only by building of our understanding of this, and only by building our understanding of this material holistically, rather than discussing it in isolation, can we incorporate it into our wider, into wider interpretations of Roman British society. And this is precisely what I'm attempting to do with my research with the University of Exeter, where I'll be using the, the theoretical tool of object scapes to explore their development and uh, repeated contextual associations on a landscape scale and understand how pewter fits into wider patterns of structure deposition and use of tablewares in Roman Britain in the fourth century. So, um, thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah, these are the sources for uh, my images. <laughs>